Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Joel Hunter here talking about bioethics in this video. We're going to cover human research uh, today, and we have uh, the chapter is six from your Vaughn text. This is the, I'll show it to you in case you are unsure about the edition or about the, the what it looks like. It's bioethics. This is from Oxford University Press. And we are in, as I said, chapter six, which is on page 239. And what I wanted to do today, I was having a conversation with um, a colleague via Facebook about um, some of the challenges in teaching bioethics. And one of the things that came out um, in that discussion was we are focused in, in discussing the different uh, subject matter that we've covered so far, things like informed consent last time and uh, confidentiality and so on, within the context of what's called normative ethics. So in normative ethics, we're looking for uh, rules to uh, govern our behavior, to tell us right from wrong. And so as you know, and when we talked about the very first, uh, very first week, there are several theories about normative ethics. Um, and there's consequentialism or utilitarianism. There's uh, the Kantian deontological ethics. There's social contract theory. And that's just three of the major ones, to name a few. But you know, even within any of those normative ethic, ethical theories, there is a backdrop of welfare or well-being. And there are theories about those too. And those are called value theories. In other words, we're interested in knowing, well, what is worth pursuing? What is valuable? Is there something that's valuable in its own right um, or intrinsically valued, as we would say, or are all values extrinsic? In other words, they're valuable insofar as they get us something else. Well, in the discussions that we have had so far, uh, one of the major cons ethical considerations in medical ethics is going to be beneficence. Now, to do good to another person, and that's the, that's the norm, do, do good to others, um, do act in such a way that you improve a person's life rather than make it worse off. Well, there's a big assumption there, isn't there? What is making a person's uh, life better? Um, how do we pursue the good both as a patient and as a practitioner? Okay, so in medical ethics then, the assumption would be that health is the primary value that we're after, right? To improve not only our own health, but obviously the, the people that we are treating. So beneficence, medical beneficence then, is, in the, is against the backdrop uh, of a value given to health. Okay, and that's fine, but we have to understand how that is a limited concept of what is either valuable in itself or what is actually uh, a person's good or in their welfare or promotes their good. Okay, so think about that for a second. You have a patient or you are a patient and one of your considerations would certainly be uh, the health of your patient or your own health, right? But there's a lar there are larger considerations as well. Like maybe health isn't the most important value to you. Um, maybe there are other considerations where, and, and this is, uh, this, we don't have time to discuss it, but I just want to bring it to your attention that it could be that there are important reasons that one might sacrifice one's health or not do all that one can to um, uh, maximize one's treatment. You know, and the obvious example would be things like cost. Now, back over to the considerations of, of a medical care practitioner. Now, oftentimes, they are practicing within a particular context, and that's the context of an, of an institution. Now, one of the moral conflicts that will occur is over this question of value, of competing values. So on the one hand, you know, as a pure practitioner, you will have the desire to promote health. Um, and so your duty to, to, uh, to do good to others, the duty of beneficence, 
can come into conflict with institutional values, like the institute, like the like an institutional value to um, expand uh, one's power or to maximize profits. Those are values too, and you can see how they could come into conflict. So if we don't actually think about value theory and uh, maybe pr try to think about how medical ethics is within uh, a context, a broader context of, um, of wider considerations of value, um, then, you know, for, okay, for example, one possible value that might override things like health would be the pursuit of knowledge. Uh, medical practitioners can sometimes sacrifice their health, their own well-being on a physical level or even a mental level in the pursuit of knowledge. Why? Because knowledge is so valuable. Okay, what about other considerations? What about other value considerations that might override that uh, uh, duty to promote one's health? Okay, so you can think about that. There are certainly other other considerations. Um, there are other regarding desires as well, or other regarding values as well. Um, but I just want to bring that to your attention. I thought that was a really interesting um, discussion because we don't really talk about uh, value or values within the text. They are assumed. And I just want to bring it to your attention that uh, you don't have to assume a particular value. Um, and it's helpful, I think, when you're looking at how different normative theories uh, result in different actions that you should take and recommend different actions, it's still worth pausing to think about, well, what values are at stake here? What are the implications for things that we think are, 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 uh, are worth doing um, or worth pursuing? So that's my little intro <laughs> to human research. And I... I, it was such a timely discussion because I think the question of value, um, the question of what is best for us, what is most valuable for us, uh, could have no more important um, uh, timeliness than in talking about human research. All right, so let's turn to that now and go through a few slides that I will share with you um, and we will discuss Chapter six of the Vaughn text. Okay, so let me grab my mouse here. There we go. So this week, what we're going to do is, um, if you are following a full semester with me, then this is the first chapter where we're going to start dividing the instructional text from the readings, the primary readings that support the instructional text. So. What we're going to do in this video is just focus on the instructional text and we'll look um, next time at um, the, uh, the specific readings that I've selected for you to support this text. Okay, so what do we mean when we talk about human research? Well, what we're doing is in as an ethical question, we're talking about looking at the moral dilemmas that, re that arise when... Uh, the technological advances, medical advances, scientific advances have, uh, have carried us so far. There are very ambitious corporate interests, of course, as well as academic interests, other institutions um, who wish to solve medical problems, uh, you know, very durable and, and uh, troublesome and, um, and, and, and ones that have del really deleterious effects on public health around the world. And we know that scientific inquiry has produced enormous benefits uh, over the last uh, 100 years especially. But then we have to look at that ambition against the historical backdrop of abuses, and abuses in particular of human subjects, humans who have been uh, the subjects of research and, and most often, um, the, when we talk about abuse, we're talking about unwilling subjects. Okay, so let's talk then about what is the, the approach taken in human research, uh, the, uh, uh, the kind of intervention that is accepted practice is the clinical trial. 
And you can think of this as um, the trying to discover uh, a new drug or a new form of treatment, a uh, new course of treatment uh, to address some medical issue. And um, it's in its technical sense, it is then a scientific study. Okay, so it's governed by certain methods uh, accepted in scientific practice, it, but it's designed to systematically test a medical intervention in humans. And so you have to you have to look at the effects on humans in order to be able to run this kind of study. Now, there are some important terms that I need you to know that go with and into a clinical trial. The first concept is blinding, and blinding is a way to ensure that the subjects, both the subjects and the researchers, do not know which interventions the subjects receive. So let me back up and say something about the intervention. So the standard clinical trial, you got three courses or three types of treatment. One is a standard treatment, and that would be whatever the existing kind of treatment is for the particular malady that's being studied. If there is one, and sometimes there isn't one, like in certain forms of cancer, um, there's no standard treatment um, except as a way, um, not in, in terms of uh, uh, correcting um, or uh, curing a disease, right? But there are ways of treating the effects of the cancer. Um, that may not be the best example since so much has changed uh, recently about that. But anyway, uh, if you think about uh, what what is the standard way that a particular condition is treated today? Okay, so that's one type of intervention. The second type would be, well, what is the new treatment that is proposed that we're going to try out? Okay, so that's the that's the one that we hope will be effective. And then we have the third type of intervention is the placebo, and this is included in order to account for the well documented, well understood placebo effect which is when we're talking about humans and and a lot of the research is going to be reports of the subjective experience that they feel um, in the treatment. Well, some will report that, oh yeah, I feel so much better, um, but haven't been given anything except maybe a sugar pill, you know, in the case of a medication. So the placebo effect is also one of the interventions that may be included, and we're going to say a little more about that um, in just a bit. So anyway, the interventions the subject receive, what we want to be is blind as to which subjects are getting them. And we don't want to know as researchers, if I'm looking at subject Joel, I don't want to know whether he got the standard treatment, the new treatment, or the placebo, because then we can introduce bias. Uh, we're after, we want certain results if we know what that treatment was. Okay, so then connected with that is, and the other another term I need you to know is randomization. I'm skipping over placebo since I just talked about it. Um, a placebo is just, you know, an ineffective or sham treatment. Um, so the randomization then is where the, uh, who gets the different treatments, the three different treatments, is assigned randomly. So there's no, um, there's no uh, uh, there's no rule to say okay well let's say males between the ages of 30 and 45 are going to get the placebo treatment and then women between the ages of 35 are going to get the new now you don't want to break things down by some sort of predictable rule and so uh, again why because that can introduce bias if you know the rule so by assigning subjects randomly uh, to both experimental groups and control groups, then you can uh, ensure that you are, uh, you are minimizing bias in your study. Okay, so let me see if I have uh, covered everything. Um, so, oh, I should say, yeah, I mentioned control and experimental group. Um, so the control group, you know, they're going to be getting the, um, the standard treatment. Or, or no treatment, or placebo treatment. And then the experimental group is the one who is receiving the new treatment, just to clarify that. Okay, so now let's look at the different phases 
or stages of a clinical trial. And there, it breaks down into two different stages, essentially. One stage is non-therapeutic. Those are the early stages. And the second stage is therapeutic. All right, so in phase one, we're, we're just getting a small sample uh, of subjects and we're checking mainly for safety and uh, adverse reactions so that we don't um, you know cause uh, 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 um, unhealthy effects over a wider group of people all right so we are looking for then uh, the reactions the initial reactions in the experimental group in the ones who are receiving the new treatment um, for safety, for the safety of uh, those individuals, for the safety of the drug, and for adverse reactions that the uh, subjects may have. Okay, and so there we're testing things like dosage amounts. And that gets refined in phase two, where you get a larger group, once some of the basic safety issues are covered, then you get a larger group of subjects. And now you're starting to get some idea of the kind of effectiveness that the uh, the treatment might have and of course you're continuing to assess the safety of the uh, of the drug okay phase three trial now we're talking about therapeutic where we are actually um, trying to establish the effectiveness of the drug where it is treating the condition that's targeted okay so we are um, now comparing it to other kinds of treatments, standard treatments or other proven treatments, and we're learning them um, how to use it in the safest way. We've, we're, uh, we've got dosage amounts that have some uh, uh, now experimental uh, support for those amounts. And we are now looking for definitive answers about the treatment's worth. Is it effective? Okay, and there's phase four. I think, did I skip over that? I didn't even put it in. Phase four um, are sometimes done, and that is um, really once the uh, drug is marketed, you're looking for uh, these are longitudinal studies are looking for really long-term effects. Um, so yeah, but I didn't even include that one in, in uh, here because we're mainly looking at the non-therapeutic phases versus the therapeutic phase, which is the final phase. Okay, so now we get into the ethical considerations of the clinical trial. Um, these really start on page 242, but and it goes through the end of the chapter. But let me just tick off a few of them. You are, uh, you will need to look at these uh, uh, on your own. Each of them is discussed in depth, pages 242 uh, over to 245. Okay, so let's hit the first one, which is um, carried over from the previous chapter on informed consent. You remember in the subject of informed consent, we were talking about where uh, the, uh, the patient is given in enough information or applicable and relevant information to make a decision for themselves about treatment. And, and that was a medical intervention. And we also mentioned or experimentation and so now we're in the experiment experimentation um, uh, application of this concept of informed consent so subjects have to give their informed voluntary consent to participate in a clinical trial that's the number one step uh, the number one requirement second point the study has to minimize risks to subjects as far as possible and offer an acceptable balance of risks and benefits. Subjects have to be selected fairly to avoid exploiting or unjustly excluding them. And this will get, we'll talk about this in a moment when it comes to vulnerable populations in particular uh, and the exposure that they have to being, uh, to being mistreated uh, and exploited. The subject's privacy should be protected and the confidentiality of research data must be preserved. Okay, so we have discussed these topics as well. You see how it's all coming together here in the subject of human research. And then lastly, 
before the research is conducted, you have to have an independent group of knowledgeable individuals review the proposed study. And that has to be then approved by that panel. This is often called IRB or Institutional Review Board. And any institution that conducts research, whether it's medical research or even uh, sociological research or psychological research, anything where human, human beings are the subjects of the study, where data is collected about them, um, that has to be approved by an IRB. And that's, of course, um, a, uh, it's an external check on the ambition that you might have as a researcher to find the solution that you're after and that would help people. Okay, so now we've looked at the, uh, the ethical requirements. Now let's look at the moral principles that apply. And they are already familiar to you. And you'll notice that the three major ones here that we've called out, number one is autonomy. And that is, uh, of course, the respect for persons as autonomous agents. We've seen this uh, in, in reference to comp uh, the importance of confidentiality and the importance of informed consent. There is the moral principle of beneficence. And I've mentioned this in the sort of intro part where I was talking about uh, you know, the, the uh, duty to do good for others and avoid harm to people. And of course, that is the part where I talk about the value of what is actually a person's good. Well, when we're talking about bioethics, what we typically are limiting that to, of course, is doing good in the sense of health, in the sense of uh, medical welfare, right? Uh, and then finally, the third moral principle that is relevant here is justice, and that is treating equals equally, uh, not treating uh, people as means to an end, even though that is what is going on. People, people, human subjects are a means to an end, acquiring knowledge, acquiring effective treatments. Um, however, in the process, people have to be willing to subject themselves to that. That's where the justice part comes in. So yes, you're treating people as means to an end, but those people have voluntarily uh, allowed themselves to be treated thusly because of the other kind of benefits that might come from it or for whatever reasons they may have uh, to uh, maybe in the case of improving their own health. Okay, so uh, the factor of justice is important and there's a social, of course, co uh, dimension to this as well where we look at particular populations and, and the quality has to extend across those populations. And this is where the, the history of abuses of human research uh, come up, and these are discussed in your text in some of the, um, the, the called out areas that are uh, the in depth, where maybe women have been mistreated, uh, the Tuskegee experiments, uh, notorious syphilis, ex uh, syphilis experiments that occurred in the 20th century over a span of about 50 years, uh, the treatment of uh, uh, mentally retarded children. Uh, and, and subjecting them to hepatitis, uh, the Willowbrook Institution. Um, so when we think about those, these different populations, this is why justice is important, is that we are not uh, exploiting uh, vulnerable groups, of those who cannot say no, um, either because of, for reasons of competence or um, because those who are exercising power or oppressive power over them do not uh, conduct themselves and treat those folks as uh, ends in themselves um, and valuable in their own right. Okay, so what's the justification then for conducting clinical trials since there are so many ways that it could go wrong and has gone wrong? Um, well, the obvious would be the utility of, of increasing the overall good um, by improving the health of individual patients and therefore the society as a whole. So the potential good for individual subjects and to future patients and society is um, the usual justification for therapeutic trials. 
Now, the phase, remember the phase one and phase two stages in the clinical trial are non-therapeutic. So what's the justification for that? Um, well, that's also justified by the potential good to society. Notice that you're not doing good to the subject themselves in a non-therapeutic uh, trial. You're not doing good even really to future patients if you don't know that the therapeutic, um, or sorry, that the intervention will have therapeutic benefits. So all you have to justify then, morally speaking, the non-therapeutic dimension of a trial or the non-therapeutic stages of a trial are the broader and you know less defined, less immediate potential good uh, for uh, the social good, public health. And that, I'm, I don't mean to sound that like that's a diminished thing, but notice how that is, uh, the moral justification is more limited there. Okay, so now what about these controlled trials? Remember we talked about uh, the, the different groups that you have. You have a control group and experimental group. Um, so controlled trials, um, the, some critics will say, well, you know, having a control group means that you're treating those subjects, the members of that group, as a means to the end of the sci of scientific knowledge and of uh, determining the effectiveness of the treatment. Does it work? In other words, the utility, or the um, utility is probably a confusing word to use there, the instrumental effects of the, uh, of the proposed treatment. So the response then that some will uh, say is that physicians um, don't do wrong to those patients if they've entered the clinical trial, um, uh, sorry, let me rephrase that. That was not that was not said well. The concept here is equipoise. Um, you really not you really will not find this word outside of physics um, <laughs> usually. But the idea is that you are if the if the subjects enter the clinical trial and the alternative treatments are um, balanced. In other words, the, the groups are, uh, could easily, just as easily be in the experimental group as a control group. Then the physician does no wrong. Okay, that's where the randomization, of course, comes in and the blind, uh, the fact that it would be a blind trial. Um, so the use of placebos in, uh, usually for that control group, um, the view is that if there are effective treatments already available, that it is unethical to use placebos. Why? Because there is already some sort of therapeutic benefit that the patient could receive if they get the treatment. But if you withhold the treatment from them through using a placebo in order to have that control group, then that would be unethical because why? The moral principle of beneficence. You, it is in your power to do good to them, so you should do good to them. All right, so then the, uh, uh, the question then will be, uh, what are their effective treatments for the condition that is being studied? Okay, so that will be determinative then over the ethics of having uh, subjects in the control group. Okay, so what about the concern of um, informed consent. Can a patient actually give their informed consent to be the subject of a medical study of an experiment? Um, well, think about this. If you, if you suffer from the particular condition or maybe your child suffers from the particular condition that is uh, being studied, then one might give one's consent out of desperation or out of fear, um, you know, maybe of missing out um, or just wishful thinking. You know, there's un ungrounded, irrational uh, wishes. Um, so consent, you know, can, will have more than likely some aspect of these emotional considerations. And a lot of times we think of emotional consent as this you know, purely rational, deliberative process. Um, and when you're talking about uh, you know, informed consent for um, being the subject of a test where you don't really know if you're going to be helped out or not, 
um, that seems to um, uh, that seems to make it more difficult. Okay, so paying research subjects. This is a common practice that hey, you know, you will be reimbursed maybe for mileage uh, or your time. Uh, you get a little stipend if you become a subject of an experimental test. Um, so having that incentive, having a monetary incentive can undermine informed consent because then you're doing it, you know, out of some other gain that you might get. And then there is the, the uh, same difficulty that we actually saw in discussing informed consent. And that is the, the, the technical issues of the treatment uh, or the study, the experiment that you may not be able to understand uh, because it's technical jargon or because the uh, uh, you're not a specialist. And so there's that. And then I would say that third point is carried over from the problems that we saw in the uh, in the larger question of giving informed consent. Okay, good. All right, and then the last major topic that I want to talk about is um, research on the vulnerable. Oftentimes, the vulnerable are most in need of some sort of treatment, and it can be the reason that they are vulnerable. And what we um, if we are concerned to treat all individuals equally, remember the principle of justice, um, then we don't want to treat them as means to an end. We want to treat them as ends in themselves and respect their humanity. Um, so our moral conflict then is that we then, we then who are uh, uh, either competent or in power or hold power, have a duty to shield the vulnerable from abuse. Um, and that can sound like paternalism, uh, which, which sometimes it would be. The other, however, side to this or pro our, uh, thing that introduces the conflict is then the desire to benefit those individuals or society as a whole through this needed research. Okay. So we need to shield them, but at the same time, we need them in order to do good for them and for society. So there is your, uh, moral conflict or moral dilemma. Okay, so we can, uh, I want to point you then to some discussion of that that occurs on page 249. So you should look at the uh, specific uh, conditions that have been, um, uh, that have been put in place by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, um, in particular with research that is done on children where what the guidelines that uh, attempt to navigate that moral dilemma, again, speaking about the vulnerable, where children obviously would be one of those uh, vulnerable groups. And then lastly, um, as your text is organized, you have the, uh, the section on how you apply uh, or what happens when you apply the major theories to this issue and um, where the focus tends to, to uh, to uh, uh, become, and so you have the Kantian deontological approach, you have utilitarian approach, and social contract theory are also discussed. So just as a reminder, um, your key terms in this section are the clinical trial, what is that? I need you to know that, I need you to know what blinding is, I need you to know what randomization is, I need you to know what placebos are, what the placebo effect is, and it would be helpful to know what equipoise is as well. That was sort of a technical term as well. Okay, so what we're going to do then is have a, a quiz over that material, and then uh, the following week you'll have a series of short answer um, essay responses to the readings from chapter six. But again, that is going to be in the next video, and I'll discuss your readings uh, for that at that time. All right, thanks for tuning in, and good luck on your quiz, and I will see you next time.